Episode of Legal Empowerment through Interaction Lecture Series. Uh, today we are privileged by a couple of things. Number one, the person who is going to introduce is a family member. The person who is going to address us is another family member. And we are privileged, uh, privileged with two other family members like Kamen, uh, Ram Kumar sir and Ramakrishnan sir. And the entire extended family of littles are today uh, in spite of this technical hitches. Uh, when we are addressing on a topic of uh, positive or negative sanctions, or when you are uh, thinking of punishments, is it retributive? It is um, uh, reformative? Is it, um, um, uh, I don't know, uh, different things, which I don't want to touch upon in the sense like, is punishment itself a punishment? Let's see. And for that matter, uh, we'll have for the introductory remarks, this is Roshan Dalvi, ma'am, and the subject will be dealt with Professor Rose Vergis, ma'am. Um, we are privileged with the presence of Ramakrishnan sir and Ram Kumar sir and uh, all of you wonderful persons. And let's see. Over to you, Roshan Dalvi, ma'am. Good evening, everybody, all my friends, and good evening, Dr. Rose Vergis. Uh, it is such a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I think this could be an amalgamation of experience and expertise. And for a topic of this nature, which is, I would say, the basic structure of the criminal law, we would have to take care and caution in understanding what is punishment, whether there should be punishment or not. And if there is no punishment, the test is, would there be no crimes? Now, when I was a little girl, and I think in about grade four in my school, I had a prose lesson in Hindi. And it dealt with our king Vikramaditya, a great, a just ruler. Now, one thing that remained in my mind for us six decades, and I've written about that in my book also, was the line that he was such a good and a just ruler. Unke rajya mein apradiyo ko kari se kari saja di jati thi. And then the next line was, isi liye unke rajya mein koi apradi hi na tha. Now this remained in my memory. Along with this, what also remained from those days when we were studying history and geography is the justness of Jangir, the Mughal ruler. He was called Jangir the Just. And we know very well the story that he goes to the forest. Uh, he wants to shoot. He misses. And he shoots uh, Dobi. The wife becomes a widow and comes to him for justice. And Jangir, being the just ruler that he was, he said that you must get back what you have lost. And how will you get back? I can't bring back your husband. But you can kill me and make her a widow also. And he points to his queen. So you see, this was the kind of punishment that our rulers of ancient times thought of. We have gone a long way from 1959 when the Criminal Procedure Code was enacted and 1860, from 1859 and 1860 when the IPC was enacted and we got various punishments. But what is today's position in the world? We would consider Singapore deterrent punishment and really deterring. There are people who do certain things in Singapore which they would 
they would not do certain things in Singapore, which they would do with Iran in India. Then what about Saudi Arabia? The drug cases, the punishments for having drug, drugs. Now, these punishments being so severe, there has been a deterrent effect. That is one side of the story. In Canada, there are anti-drug courts. Now, the government of Canada realized that for a drug addict to be taken into custody and to be kept in custody, they are incurring an expense of $100,000 a year. And the cost-benefit ratio was very negative. So they don't take them to prison, but they take them in other institutions, get them withdrawn, give them a certificate of withdrawal, and they enter our society. Now, we have also known about persons or individuals who have believed in no punishments. The priest, Dr. Staines, he was killed. His wife said that she does not want to prosecute. She does not want punishment. And she forgives. A true Christian attribute. This happened also to certain blacks in America. But after that forgiveness by a black family, we still have policemen killing blacks. And blacks' life matter. Matters go on. Now you see, court has to mean business. We would come to brass tacks. When I was in England, we studied a case of domestic violence. Now in England, there was no minimum sentence at that time. It was in 1996 that I was there. The minimum sentences came only after the Crim Crimes Act of 2003. At that time, the judges felt that if there are minimum sentences imposed by law, then there is sort of, you know, no independence of the judiciary. But what was happening was, and we were studying the cases of crimes against women, what was happening was that in absolutely two similar cases of rape, in one case, the judge gave seven years sentence. And in another case, he let off the accused on caution. Now, there was a lot of uproar that the certainty of punishment is more important than the severity of punishment. Persons must know what is going to be at least some punishment that they're going to have because the case prosecutes the crime and that is for the victim's sake. We, of course, think of the accused and we have come of age in thinking of the accused, his liberty, his rights, his bail, his jail, etc. But what about victimology that must set into the system? In a case of domestic violence, when I was in England, the judge gave a sentence of 200 pounds in the case where the man had bit his wife so hard that his, her rib had broken. He goes out of the court and he tells his wife, at the rate of 200 pounds, I'm capable of breaking a couple of more ribs. Now, this is the experience that I've had of actual cases in courts. In US, there is very strict punishment for perjury. In one of my civil cases, which was between a husband and a wife, and there were many properties involved. The husband was not showing the properties, and the wife said that when we were in California, he had given a list of properties. The advocate impertinently tells me that, yes, but that was in California, and there is a lot of punishment for perjury. So on the pain of punishment, I had to show all of these properties. But these are not the properties in India that I'm going to show we have not a single conviction of perjury, though we have got an elaborate procedure which we can never really comply with the workload that we have. This also happens for breach of court cases. Kya hone wala hai is the usual refrain. 
Now there are two types of cases, heinous crimes, like murder, rape, incest, child sexual abuse, whatever, you know. Then there are repetitious crimes, repetitious offenses. There are careers in crime, robbery, counterfeiting money, scams, uh, bank frauds, human trafficking, contract killing, abuse of handicapped children, child sexual abuse, etc. They go on happening again and again. Now the deterrence that we talk about, the remorse that we require is of that one accused who may or may not again do the same thing when he is let off. But there are several cases also, which may be one-time offenses. Consider the case of a rape of an innocent child and a boy and a girl living together. The girl is a minor and there is statutory rape. What punishment should be given, especially given the fact that after the criminal uh, amendment act of 2013 now, the minimum, less than the minimum sentence cannot be imposed. And hence we have restorative justice. Three cases come to mind, and those also I've written in my book, Tangible Justice. One was the case of Bambi. It was a poacher, and the court of Missouri said that he should see the movie Bambi, which was made by Walt Disney. It was about a deer, and how the mother was killed, and the child deer comes where the skin of the mother is, and goes away when the drummer who has put the skin of that mother after killing the mother, goes away. Now, if this really hits him hard, and if he considers something that has gone wrong, restorative justice would be the answer. There is a case where a man has written a letter to a victim, and he says that while writing the letter, he changed and he understood what the victim could have gone through. There was a case of a tightrope walker in New York. He went up on the, uh, on the skyscrapers. He did not kill himself or he did not, there was no accident. But he was arrested because he could have harmed himself. He was brought before the magistrate and convicted. And the sentence was that he shall not do this again at such height. And he will do this to teach some children in the school in Central Park but not at a height of more than five feet. So his artistry was taken care of, was, was appreciated, and yet the offense was reduced. Then there was a case of a drunken driver who was asked to give his credit card details, asked to download apps of Uber, etc., and to find out how people go into those cars and how their lives are precious. These are all restorative justices. We had a case of ragging in the court. It was in an all-girl college in Bombay. And girl killing girl. The ragging went so awry that the girl was killed. The man, the, her father, who had this only child, was so distraught. He was a government servant. He gave up his job. And he filed a criminal complaint, a private complaint, and a police complaint was going on. He was kind of almost getting worked up. He could not even suggest that in that kind of a case, restorative justice would have served the purpose. These children were children ultimately, and they did something grossly wrong. They would never, never, ever repeat it. I had a case of Bank of India robbery. It was with a gun. I gave him seven years. And I was told after some time that this boy who, who had a first was a first time offender has now joined the Arun Gauli gang. I don't know if I was responsible or the prison reforms were responsible. But these are the two types of cases that must be considered when we are considering what kinds of punishment, if any, should be given. Now, in our DV, DV Act, 
and in our posh the, uh, the, uh, the sexual harassment act we've got a provision for mediation because not many wives want their husbands to go to jail and even in the office setting the men can be cultivated and can have remorse for the wrongs that they do but what happens to a child sexual offender generally it happens in all homes and they go on unabated because nobody complains and therefore now we have got a purse, a, a provision in poxo that if you come to know of a crime it is a crime not to complain which of course should, be, should have been taken for granted even earlier so there is law for protection of victims there is prison reform for reformation of the accused and on that note and considering that law does not to uh, uh, prevent what law cannot protect we will hear dr burgess on that erudite lecture this is only my experience a little experience which i have shared with her deep knowledge of what could be a criminal justice system thank you dr burgess good evening no. your lordship Honorable Justice Roshan Dalvi, Justice Ram Kumar, Justice Ram Krishna and Krishna Iyer, Advocate Sham Padman and his learned team. At the outset, and my dear friends, at the outset, I wish to place on record my appreciation, actually, for the commendable initiative taken by Advocate Sham Padman and his team. in sustaining this legal empowerment lecture series today being the 253rd episode and i think it was an ideal step to take during this pandemic this online in this which i would call an online era i must admit i've learned so much by participating in most of these interactions with justice ram kumar and other renowned speakers always you know enriching us with a lot of knowledge and rich experience like today just as roshan has you know it's a i would say a remarkable introductory uh, it's a, a remarkable your introductory note you've delved into the topic actually there are things which about the earlier past and the cases you handled which uh, is a rich experience for each of us i feel i'm a little too small to speak in this group but let me try to express my views before delving into the topic with the permission of the chair the topic concept of punishment i would like to say that as a professor of criminal law i have time and again express my view maybe mostly at academic circles but the thinking of criminal law at the graduation level in most of the institutions in fact all of us learned the indian penal code the criminal procedure code and the evidence act but that would never give us a comprehensive view of the subject so wherever i was teaching i forcefully introduced subjects like criminology and penology into the curriculum it's at post graduation level that i went into criminology penology victimology and criminal justice administration which would actually take us to the genuine questions on why so much crime in society that criminology which i won't touch upon today it's not fair to deviate then why do we punish what is the objective of punishment see we have an aim for whatever we do there's an aim what are the aims of punishment and with our present criminal justice system are we achieving these aims i would not say we are not i'm literally uh, literally proud of the indian judiciary if ever there are loopholes it lies elsewhere because 
We also study criminal justice administration, where the police play a role, the police system, the prosecutorial system, expert evidence, forensic science, the judiciary, in trying to meet out justice to the victim or to society at large. So it's not entirely on the judicial. We have people reading newspapers of acquittal and they immediately criticize. What did this judge do? How could he, he acquit? Very easily said when we read newspapers. Why does this topic of justice and punishment assume greater importance in criminal law? We know that we have the accusatorial system of punishment. Unless the judge does uh, uh, co cogent evidence, and unless the prosecution we all know has proved beyond all reasonable doubt, a judge cannot convict. I'm sure the judges sitting here will agree with me that even if there's an iota of doubt in the mind of a judge, he or she would acquit. Because we cannot afford to convict the wrong person. So conviction and later the sentencing plays a very, very important role in our criminal justice system. In criminal matters, when I talk of punishment, I'm, with your permission, just discussing criminal law today, criminal cases. In criminal cases, a family member is murdered, the entire household is robbed, a daughter is raped, a full hotel and city is taken off by terrorist activities. And when you rush to make a complaint, you are told, don't take law into your own hands. Step out, not rudely, but directly or indirectly, that's what we tell the victim, step out. The state will take care. That is where the role of the police, the public prosecutor and the judge is emphasized. The state assumes the responsibility of punishing the offender. In civil wrongs, we know it's more compensatory in nature, but in criminal, but criminal offenses are punitive in nature. But why punitive? People would say, why do you punish? Why do you go for harsh punishment? An instance which I cite in the classroom to my students is, suppose I want to attend an interview. Five years of a law course is over and I really wanted to join this particular lawyer's office. I've been called for an interview at 10 a.m. I'm rushing to reach at 10 because of the traffic jam, the roads, the blocks, which we all know. When I'm when it's about 10 minutes more for my time, I again see a traffic jam. Well, the moment that's cleared, the first thing I would do is press the accelerator and try to go faster. I have just one aim in mind. I don't want to miss this office which I have joined. When I completed law, I joined Justice e I mean, sorry, I joined Swami. Anyone aspiring to join a particular lawyer or law firm or corporate office or wherever, you want to reach your destination in time. Most so I would say the judges who come to the court, I'm sure they would just think of punctuality as priority. Well, you will say start at 6 a.m. But I'm just taking a situation where there was a total block. You would run, drive fast. Now, suppose when we drive fast, we run over a man. And he's killed, he's dead. Now we have two or three judges sitting here today. I'm going to cite a different instance. I have a dushman, an enemy. I just can't stand him. To law students, I tell them, young guys, you just think that the next door man is in love with the same girl whom you are in love. Somewhere you want him out of your life. 
We'll have to give them examples where they would relate to it. But I'm just saying, now you want to kill that man. So you observe him, his movement, and you see that every morning, early morning, he's going for a walk. Take the Delhi roads, minus two degrees, pitch dark, but at five, four in the morning, he's taking his morning walk. You take your car out and you run over him. You hit against him, you reverse your car, you again run over him. A third time, what is it that you want? You want to ensure the death of the person. Not leaving him with a fracture. Because then with the sympathy wave, that girl may love him even more. You want him out of your life. Now, both the instances, in criminal law, when we talk of punishment, we first look at why punish? And then you look at the nature of the crime. In both instances, and in all criminal cases, we look at the weapon used. Was it a stab, a, a dagger, a knife? So, or a spear like our Virsa Singh case. So what the, the instrument used is a car in both cases. Even in the first instance, where you were rushing for your interview and you drove over a man, you cannot be acquitted. When Lord Macaulay drafted the IPC in 1860, there were no BMWs or cars or leave alone BMW, any cars on the road. He did, not that he did not envisage it, but somehow you'd see that it has not found a place in the IPC of 1860. But we all know with 304A, now rash and negligent act, they don't say driving, is punished. Mm -hmm. Why are you punishing that now? Because it has become rampant. Road accidents have become rampant. So now you see that you need to punish, even if it is a kind of a negligent act. But I'm still comparing the two instances. Justice Roshan will agree with me, and I'm sure Justice Ram Kumar too. We have Justice Krishnaya here. Would you ever think of the same punishment for both these people? One also ran over the car, killed the man. The other also you run over a man. But you know so much, the very crux of criminal law is the mind of the person, the mental element. So you try to understand why did he commit the crime? That's why I say also the study of criminology is equally important. Now coming particularly to the concept of punishment. Crime we all know is an evil and the purpose of penal law is to reduce its incidence to the maximum extent possible. In the past, this was thought to be achieved by severely punishing the criminal. Severely. But gradually, the idea began to gain ground that the approach should not be one of condemning or crushing the criminal, but one of reforming and rehabilitating him in society. Today, criminologists and jurists are so concerned about the purpose and function of criminal. Though the question of crime is as old as the human race, we continue to get fundamentally different answers to questions such as what is crime? Who is a criminal? What are the causes for the crime? If a five-year-old boy grew up, I'm just taking that when he was five, every day he sees his father coming home drunk and beating up his mother. Every day, cruel as ever. He's too young to take it on his father. But he's seeing the scene every day in his house. I cite this example also in class. He is a person who is seeing the eyewitness we now call, who is seeing this every day of his life. Now he can't beat his father. He's too young for that. But I don't know if you'll agree with me. He'll grow up with an aggressive mind. He may, but he will, according to me, take it on others, on his classmates. He may beat up the next door. I mean, the boy sitting next for a small, very small matter. He may steal a loaf of bread when he's hungry because the mother tells him after the drunk stage and the beating that there's no food in the house. 
he might be caught stealing a loaf of bread. Well, now we have the Juvenile Justice Act and all that. I'm not going into statute. But the first step, if people saw him stealing, mm -hmm. the owner of the shop and people close by would beat him up and give him up to the police. All that we know is that he's a criminal. People would point out and say he's a criminal. He's a criminal. Now the judges would naturally want to know how he became a criminal. And I believe that criminology, in the study of criminology, we learn whether it's a sociological reason, for an economic reason, psychological reason, what leads to criminality. That takes us to then how do we address the crime and how do we punish? That is where the concept of punishment is important. Because the societal reaction to crime will vary from time to time. It will vary with space, but it has undergone several changes, of course, with the advancement of human civilization. We know that in the Gulf countries for theft, the hand would be cut off. I don't know where or if it ever continues anywhere for sexual offenses, the punishment would be castration. So the, the retributive attitude was the call of the day at that time. See, philosophers, Aristotle, Kant, Sir James Stephen are the classical advocates of this year. It is actually called a theory of revenge. As Madam just said it, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth policy. If a person is struck, the first reflection is to strike back. And prisoners were regarded as poisonous snakes. And under the early Germanic, Germanic system, we all know it was this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth policy. Now, what retributism is actually mm -hmm. suggesting, though we are now a little against this total eye for an eye policy, what they're suggesting is that the punishment must fit the crime. Now, we speak of individualization of sentences, depending on the crime. But even our Indian penal code has to be, and is to some extent, retributive in nature. The punishment for theft is something under 378 and the punishment under 379. The punishment for robbery is more. The punishment for extortion is still more. The punishment for decoity is still more. And you will see 360, decoity with murder, it's death penalty. It is retributive. It's not eye for an eye, but the, the punishment should fit the crime. For a person who has committed theft, you're not going to give the same punishment which you would give the decoits where it was decoity followed with murder. So to some extent, the retributive theory still holds good, though not in the technical sense of eye for an eye. Bentham says, Jeremy Bentham, our utilitarian philosopher says, there can be no doubt that revenge is sweet, even to modern man. Bentham says it's like honey dropping from the lion's mouth. Retribution actually provides an opportunity to the public at large to stand together against the enemy of accepted values. The Nirbhaya case in Delhi is what we usually quote now. But there have been many such cases. This somehow came out more to light. When I did my MPhil thesis, atrocious cases. I shall mention one or two later. Justice Krishna and, uh, and uh, Professor Pendra Bakshi were asked to comment and decide whether I should be awarded an MPhil. I just went to sentencing sessions cases which were not reported. Shocking cases. Well, I'll, I'll give, come to that a little late. But of course, the retributive theory is still subject to criticism. 
it is accused of being inhuman, cruel, outmoded. Though many jurists have expressed a view that the retributive theory does not have any more scope under the modern scientific penalty. Now, what is that? We come to in Dulla versus the state. I'm talking of a 1982 case where the Allahabad High Court observed that no sentence should ever appear to be vindictive. That time there was not much being said about the reformative theory, but still the judge said no sentence should appear to be vindictive. We all know about the Bhagalpur blinding case where Umesh Yadav and others were blinded by the police in a very cruel and barbaric manner. Justice Bhagwati observed, excuse me, that retribution cannot have any legitimate place in an enlightened philosophy of punishment. So I'm not contradicting when I say that even a bit of retribution pervades through the IPC. Retribution in the sense, your punishment depends on the nature of your act. The, uh, the, depending on how horrendous the act was. Patrick Devlin, the eminent jurist and judge, says that justice means retribution and nothing else. Again, the jurist Caldwell says retribution is one of the principal purposes of punishment. Even though people are talking about the reformative theory, I'm trying to say that there are judges and philosophers who still say that it is one of the principal purposes. Salmon observes that the conception of retributive justice still retains a prominent place in prominent thought. Again, according to Lord Denning, it's a mistake to consider the objects of punishment as being deterrent or reformative or preventive and nothing else. Lord Justice Denning says, the truth is that some crimes are so outrageous that society insists on adequate punishment because the wrongdoer deserves it. You will see that if a soft justice oriented judge gives a lighter punishment, we have seen the societal cry for justice. So retribution, even today, is socially an accepted function of punishment. But there are other theories which try to explain the actual reason of punishment. It is not because it's not that eye for an eye policy, but again, Beccaria and Bentham say that the end of punishment should not be to torment offenders, but what is our main purpose then? To prevent others from committing similar offenses and to deter that particular person also from committing offenses. So, uh, uh, as observed by Rupert Cross, we all know Rupert Cross, the author of the book, Precedent. He says that idea common to the deterrent theory of punishment. Note what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize on the deterrent theory of, theory of punishment. He says the idea common to the deterrent theory of punishment is that the experience and threat of punishment should discourage crime. There is individual deterrence to deter the person and general deterrence to deter the public. Long-term deterrence, that's denunciation, to help people to maintain standards. But with the deterrent theory, please note a very important point which I would like to discuss with the group today. Even death penalty, which we have retained in our uh, criminal justice system. We all know from Jagmohan Singh, Rajendra Prasad, Pachan Singh's case, Machi Singh, uh, uh, Kehar Singh's case, Tarlok Singh, Santa Singh, Alauddin Mian, Juman Khan are all cases where death penalty was awarded. 
and our court consistently held that the, the death penalty is not unconstitutional. Of course, the Article 21 argue, argument comes in, but our courts have expressed reasons why it is not, uh, 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 why death penalty is not unconstitutional. I'm worried if I'm taking more time, but I have a little more to say because we started late. Should I cut short? No, no. no you will tell me. Please, please go on. Please, please see, continue. Sir, see, uh, in Kehar Singh's case, we all speak of Bachchan Singh in the rarest of rare cases. The court said the accused will get, is convicted and will be awarded death penalty, not because the Prime Minister of India was murdered, but they reiterated that the death penalty is being awarded because the person in whom she reposed confidence has turned around and killed. So through these cases, we tried to analyze what are these rarest of rare cases. I won't go to that. One of the speakers was at the same forum very much in detail discussed already death penalty. I'm not going into it. I'm only trying to say that in cases where people think, oh, their death penalty was given because it was the Prime Minister of India, they're mistaken. The judge wanted to make it very, make it crystal clear that the policy, you know, the fact that the uh, person turned, uh, the person in whom she had reposed confidence has turned around and killed. Anyway, these are some of the instances where we draw the guidelines laid down by the courts. Now, the sociological scientists, it's not fair if I only speak of what lawyers or judges say, because now we know about the integrated subject way of approaching a subject. The sociological scientist says, Martin P. Golding says, that the theory of deterrence has a role to play even in modern criminology. Modern criminology talks of genuine reasons why a person committed a crime. But yet, the judge, I mean, Martin P. Golding says, the theory of deterrence still has a role to play in modern criminality. Take the punishment of death penalty in Jagmohan Singh. Take the punishment in Ediga Anamal's case. I would quickly like to quote my favorite judge, no partiality, but I really mean it for my heart, Justice Krishnaya. In Ediga Anama, we are, uh, I'll just quickly tell you where a woman left her home. She was treated badly. She went to settle down in her own in another village. She was almost in the verge, on the verge of suicide, but there she met a man who started giving her some love. So for the first time, she started realizing that life is worth living. See the love I'm getting from him. She was beginning to give up her idea of suicide and they were, they fortunately or unfortunately, they developed, I should say, sorry, unfortunately, they went into physical relationship. One day she told this man, my life has been so miserable. I've been beaten up. I've been treated so cruelly. I wish no other wife would ever face this. The man, and he, she tells him, let us get married. The man tells her, he literally laughed a bit and said, marry? I've got a wife and two children. Edgar and Amma, in the state of mind that she was in, she could not take it anymore. She once walks into his house knowing he's not there. She stabs that wife and two innocent children. The facts of the case, just as Krishnaya himself said, was a horrendous crime, a cruel murder, where he, she stabs two innocent lives. The Andhra Pradesh High Court gave her death penalty. But our judge, he said, it's true. I'm not denying it that it is a horrendous crime, but we have to look at what led her to that. She was not a born criminal like Lombroso speaks of. She was never with these kind of tendencies, for only one of suicide, which is because of her misery. But 
Justice Krishnaya reduced death penalty to life imprisonment, giving excellent cogent reasons why he didn't say to acquit her, but he certainly said, let us punish her, but for life imprisonment. So I'm just trying to tell you, approaches of the court may vary, society may criticize, but the judges know what they're doing. They have the facts in front of them. They have, they have, they are looking at sociological reasons, psychological reasons, economic reasons, which have led to the incident. But they are not such, so soft justice oriented that they say, let us acquit. You've noticed it. Acquittal is only if there's a problem with our, our side, the public prosecutors or we lawyers, not the defense counsel, the public prosecutor fails to prove the case, you cannot expect the judge to convict. Now, in this Ediganama's case, just I'm quoting Justice Krishnaya, he said, deterrence through threat of death may still be a promising strategy in some frightful areas of murderous kind. He says it. It may be a promising strategy, but yet it has really Death penalty has not proved to be a sufficient deterrent. We have death penalty in our law books in a whole range of sections. We have death penalty in uh, 122, section 126, 223, 235, 251, 242, 43, 59, 296, which I said, robbery, I mean, decoity with murder. And now with the 2013, 396, decoity with murder. And now, after the 2013 amendment, we have seen that uh, a lot of, uh, with this 2013 amendment, uh, this enhancement of punishment in many crimes. 354, outraging the modesty of a woman had a very minor punishment, but now they've enhanced it. You, one may wonder, outraging the modesty, it's not rape, why do we enhance? But I can give you one case, which I refer to in my PhD thesis. I was on sentencing policy in my, when I was doing my PhD. Now, a young village girl was crossing a narrow lane and a boy, young a boy, a man overpowered her. It was a village area. Just a second. A boy, rather, sorry, a man overpowered her. I think I mentioned this case one day. I don't know if it's to the same group. I recorded this case in my in my PhD thesis. When he tried to rape her, she's a young girl, she started screaming. And she started bleeding. And when she screamed, some of the men nearby came, were coming running. Seeing the men, what this man did, he took a bamboo stick. In the village area, you find a lot of this. He took a bamboo stick and inserted it into her vagina. All of you will agree with me that the, that the definition of rape does not include this at that point. One, we had to amend the rape laws. At that point of time, uh, this would have been treated as outraging the modesty of a woman because there's no proper rape in the technical sense. Now your, the listeners should tell me, should outraging the modesty, should they be let away with a minor two years of imprisonment or taking cases of this kind, should there be an enhancement? So rightly, 2013 amendment brought in that. 2013 amendment brought in death penalty for rape and murder. But there I have my reservation. Now, I'm not against the death penalty there, but I fear that the judges, when they know that they'll have to give death penalty if there is rape and murder, will be all the more cautious. Naturally. Because the accused is going to be and obviously they get extra cautious. And where, 
rapes are committed within closed doors. Where are they going to really get the evidence? That is why I tell the institutions, teach forensic science. Also, the importance of ballistics, forensic science mechanisms to prove the guilt, to assist the judges. The Malimath Committee report, you all know it, said that they're not against the accusatorial system the adversarial system of punishment which we have. But Justice Malimath did mention mm -hmm. that we should borrow some of the features of the inquisitorial system which exist in France and other places where the judge plays a more proactive role. Here, the accused can simply afford to remain silent. He can put a duct tape on his lips and just refuse to speak. It's very irritating for the police officials when they're trying, because they will, the prosecution will shout at them, the judge will shout at the prosecutor for not giving the evidence. But they're not getting the evidence. The police then, you, so you, we notice, just resort to third degree methods. They somehow want the evidence, which we then naturally criticize. Now, what do they do? They want the truth. That is why the Malimath Committee report spoke about punishing and punishing. It's very important. The quest for truth is very important. But we come out with forensic science, a narco analysis test. We'll say, oh, it's violating Article 21, Clause 3. The, uh, uh, the uh, dentist couple, Arushi murder case. They are narco, they gave the narco analysis test code. Immediately, we have to go to our system where we say, oh, that's violating Article 21, Clause 3 of our Constitution, the doctrine of self incrimination. So there are so many intricacies in the law. I sometimes feel sorry that the social media comment without knowing exactly what has been happening. The actual truth the judge has so much of homework when he goes home. In the evening, when he reads the file, he cannot just do inky pinky pong, key father, and, and then convict any one person. He has to look for so much of truth. And where do we find the truth? But, uh, well, I should also tell you in Charles Sobraj, also Justice Krishnaya reiterated that deterrence is one of the vital considerations of punishment. We all know the U.S. case, old 1958 U.S. case, Trop versus Dull, where Justice Brennan of the U.S. Supreme Court emphasized the deter deterrent end of punishment. Mm -hmm. Justice Brennan said there is no doubt that deterrence is the end of punishment because you want to get something out of it. You want to change society. You want to change the man who did it. You want to give a message to society that if you do not punish, you won't get anything out of it. So James Stephen, if I'm not mistaken, Justice Amkuma, you may correct me later. I think Sir James Stephen played a prominent role in the drafting of the evidence. Now, he, is, uh, he says that no other punishment deters man so effectually from committing an offense as the punishment of death. He says it. According to him, it will deter man. But somehow, it is not in spite of we retaining death penalty in our law books or the Supreme Court consistently going with death penalty, we are not that ready to abolish in spite of it. And I don't mind speaking aloud. I support retaining death penalty because there are instances where you can think of nothing less than that. And the Bombay hotel was all blown up. How can, what is the other punishment than you would suggest? And uh, today our judge, Justice Roshan mentioned, one thing with long incarceration, actually, we are not realizing the expenditure for the exchequer. From early morning till dinner, we cannot say you, been, it's not the eye for eye, tooth for tooth policy in that sense. We cannot say you've done all this, so please stay there, stay hungry. 
no water, no bath, no food. You can't do that. Even to give a cup of tea to thousands. I took my students of almost all batches of technology. I took them to Tihar Delhi while I was 22 years in Delhi. While I was a dean, I went with them. Thousand people, just a cup of tea. We all know you can't give them a black tea. And milk, sugar, um, it's like I'm taking a cookery class now. <laughs> but you imagine the ingredients, milk, tea leaves, sugar, and drinking water for thousand people. That alone, you can't, we can count the expense. Well, I'm not at that part of it. But we all know the Lock Mission of India, what is second, second and then the race and later one. 287, 262nd law commission. They've recorded their views regarding the deterrent effect of capital punishment. In their view, it's still, they believe that it has, um, it does act as a deterrent, as basically, according to them, every human being dreads death. Well, researchers have yet to prove it anyway, but crime is still on the increase. We have no dearth. When I keep saying dearth, I remember legislation. In India, we have no dearth for legislation. And in India, we have no dearth for crimes. Day in and day out, we see and read of alarming reports. I always challenge my students to give me one day's newspaper out of 365 days, any one day, where you won't have a crime report, whatever be it. So with this kind of an increase, what is the concept? Why are we punishing? What are we achieving? And what should be what should be the aim? Now, the preventive theory, people would tell us, punishment is to prevent the repetition of crimes by incapa incapacitating the offenders, give long incarceration, put them behind the bars. They would be happy to be behind the other bar, of course. But when you tell them, 22, 14 years earlier, now they say, till death, let them be there. That is the preventive theory. But let me quickly move on to the rehabilitative and rest theory. Well, this theory does not say equity. This theory demands a punishment appropriate to the criminal rather than to the crime. So as against other theories, the reformative theory seeks to bring about a change in the attitude of the offense. They say at the end of the day, we want society to have a set of abiding, law-abiding members. Change them. Sometimes you would ask Charles Sobraj and other hardened criminals whether you can ever change. Well, the reformative theorists believe in a lot of change, in a lot of humane treatment. Imprisonment for a sufficient time, according to them, is enough but under healthy conditions. It should be an ideal house of correction. It should be an institutional treatment. Give probation where you can give probation. Less than the number of prisoners. When we talk of prisoners, we all know about under trial prisoners, Hussein Ara Khatun series of cases. Where 14 years they were languishing in jail when they are under trial. How can the courts not interfere in these matters? And they had to be acquitted because 14 years the court thought is good enough punishment. Where? When? When they're just under trial. Now, what's the judicial trend in the matter of rehabilitation? We all know 1950 AK Gopalan view. All of us know it. And we all know how Article 21, starting with AK Gopalan, had a lot of interpretation culminating in Maneka Gandhi's case. But the 1978 Maneka Gandhi case and the post Maneka Gandhi cases. Now, even in Article 21, there was so much interpretation. The pavement dwellers case called the Olga Telles case, the Bombay Hawkers Union case, all these cases were trying to talk of life, even Article 21, life should be interpreted correctly. Similarly, when we talk of right to life, those who argue against reformative theory, I mean, for reformative theory, they say that right to life should not include the right to 
um, suicide. Sorry, you should allow right to suicide. Uh, the um, Bombay case, first Bombay case where they said that life imprisonment, i uh, sorry, Article 21 should take into consideration persons who are putting an end to their lives. Because they, they are not able to live. They're not getting a decent life. They should be allowed to die. This is Marathi Dubal's case in the state of Maharashtra. But we all know how the Andhra Pradesh High Court at the same time in Jagdishwar versus state of Andhra Pradesh held an, an opposing view that no right to suicide should be made. I mean, suicide should be made punishment. But it was all again set right in the uh, Gyan Kors case by the Supreme Court. And still that law remains that we should punish people who are attempting suicide. Well, I'm not going into that aspect. But just to say that the earlier position was that fundamental rights could not be and should not be available to prisoners like A.K. Gopalan and fundamental right, it's a fundamental right to allow them to die. All these kind of arguments have come about. But there are a catena of decisions where the Supreme Court has extended the principle in Manika Gandhi's case to prison administration. I'm bringing up that in that context, to prison administration, saying that prisoners have a right to get fundamental, a fundamental right to get decent treatment by the jail authorities. Now, when we talk of reformative theory, again, I repeat, it is not to, it is not to acquit them, but the court is trying to say, we want to reform them, treat them like human beings, give a humane treatment, allow them to live under decent conditions. In Sunil Batra, we know again, that solitary confinement of a prisoner was condemned. No, sorry, of a prisoner who is condemned for death, putting bar fetters on him was uh, highly objected to by Justice Krishnaya. He said that when he's already condemned for death, why do you again put bar fetters on him? And he, and it was successfully challenged by uh, an excessive exercise of discretion by the jail authority. And it's in this case that Justice Krishnaya canvassed a positive experiment in rehumanization, like providing in prison music, games, prison festivals, and enabling prisoners to visit and to be visited by their families. I'm talking about rehabilitative theory to reiterate that the rehabilitative theory of punishment does not say acquit. They are only talking about what are the modes of punishment. In uh, foreign countries abroad, in the US and other states, there's a lot of uh, uh, working outside the court. They are allowed to work in the streets, in the railway station, in the tram uh, platform. So that kind of a treatment is being given where they're not really locked up in a cell. In Hiralal Malik was the state of Bihar. Again, I'm so sorry, I'm quoting Justice Krishna again. Uh, I, you know, I just couldn't help reading every single case of his. He uh, there indicated that prison justice should be mixed with humanism and goodwill rather than with vindictiveness and deterrence. So again, he says, you, it should not be vindictive and it should not be mixed with a, a deterrent approach, but with humanism. Again, in L. Vijay Kumar's case, he said there's a need to keep first offenders who are young away from hardened criminals. So this, when we speak of punishment, even in punishing, they should be kept away from hardened criminals. So this reformative trend, I'm almost coming to the end of my session, this reformative trend of looking at the criminal rather than at the crime was much reflected in the case of Edigana Maske, 
which highlights the judicial approach toward the reformative theory of mind. Focus on the criminal, not on the crime. Because otherwise, every crime should be the criminal. Now, this, when we talk of punishment, the reformative theory of punishment has also found a place in the, legis in the legislative trend. If you look at section 235, clause 2 of the CRPC, it has come about by an amendment where the court says, and it was very much emphasized in Santa Singh's case, that section 235, clause 2 of CRPC is in consonance with the modern trends in the United States. That the accused, after all the trial, which takes years, and the conviction, the judge has pronounced him guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. But again, under Section 235.2, he gives get an opportunity to be heard. Imagine again asking the accused. Here you have an opportunity to speak, not again on whether you are guilty or not. We have found you guilty, but on the question of sentence. Again, Section 354, Clause 3 of the CRPC. When the offense, when the conviction is for an offense punishable with death or in the alternative life imprisonment, the judge has to state the reasons. Earlier, when you're talking of a retributive theory, one wouldn't want to know. You just say, come on, give him the harshest punishment. But today, the judge has to give a reason why he's giving a penal punch, a, a stringent punch. Again, the Probation of Offenders Act is a milestone, actually, in the progress of the modern liberal trend of punch. In concluding, I'm again concluding with Justice Krishnaya, who advocated for rehabilitation in Maruram versus Union of India, where he says the triple puppies. Uh, uh, just kindly note his words that the triple purposes of sentencing are retribution, deterrence, and in, and in an era of human rights, rehabilitation. So even the judge agrees that retribution is also a purpose of punishment. The deterrence is also one of the purposes of punishment. But he says, when we are in an era of human rights, it should be rehabilitation. And therefore, it's like apparently clear that the purpose of punishment is not retribution alone or deterrence alone or rehabilitation. It's a functional combination of all of them. An extremist retributive view of looking only at the crime is to be abandoned and in awarding punishment, the crime the criminal and the circumstances would have to be looked into inevitably by the judge who has such an owner of trust to judge. It's very easy for society to criticize judgments, but they don't go into what are the factors which led to that judgment. So I can my concluding para that in the unending struggle to establish and maintain a just society. It has its inevitable consequence in the institution of punishment itself. Lord Denning said in his book, The Due Process of Law, that it is in the long run on the maintenance of law and order that civilized society depends. At the end of the day, it is on the maintenance of law and order that civilized society depends. And to get achieved, this state of the law and order situation, punishment is in it. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I don't know how much time I took. I, I might have exceeded an hour. I apologize to Thank the you. listeners. But sorry, absolutely, advocate. Absolutely, absolutely no issues, Rose Madam. And uh, uh, I'm just wondering, and many of us would be wondering whether uh, uh, if it is punishment uh, which alone keeps an orderly 
community i'm not very sure i had a, a doubt with uh, roshan delvi madam yesterday even, even today morning I, i believe today morning or yesterday i don't know uh, when i had a talk with her on this one whether it's retribution um, rehabilitation reformation deterrence whatever it is if it's punishment or it's a rod which keeps you on the right track then uh, the kind of society we are living in now uh, i'm not very sure about whether uh, uh maybe my concept would be uh, far amiss from the realities but before i go to ram kumar sir roshan dalvi ma'am you had asked me this and i had told you that the test is this let us have no punishments will we have no crime the other way around also ma'am we have all the punishments still we have crime Yes, we have crime because we are a country of 1.4 billion people, and therefore we are going to definitely have some crimes. But whether it is deterrent for others, whether it is at least deterrent for that same criminal, that is the purpose of law, because you have to protect the victims and you have to bring the accused to justice. and and therefore i think my justice burgess as well as i dr burgess as well as i we gave examples of two types there are certain matters where yes this could be done it is going to be a one time offense a, a a boy is in love with a minor girl when he uh, he is going to college he will get married he will settle down he will make a life for himself he may go to the moon we send him to jail but what happens to a child sexual offender a girl a, a man who rapes an, an innocent child or even a child sexual offender at home he knows that there is nobody to complain and he goes on on a better then where is the justice mm -hmm. uh, very profound very profound i'd say <laughs> um, yes, warren had said and that that should be the true test the crime problem is in part the un, uh, the uh, overdue debt a society pays for ignoring for years the conditions that breed lawlessness and when we are going to have no punishments what is going to happen everybody knows there is no punishment for anything ma'am uh, i i i'll go to ram kumar sir with only one yes. statement sir you are not being punished for stealing horses you are being punished that henceforth no horses shall be stolen over to you sir it was a well studied and illuminating forensic treat by dr rose vargis whom i know from her budding stage as a junior to senior advocate ishara yes i have heard her arguing arguing cases with in with a crisp and clear submissions probably she may not be knowing me but i have heard her i have, I have seen her in action <laughs> on the question of punishment i confess that i have had i had not undertaken any research on the question of the rarest of the rare theory propounded by the supreme court of india in the as the main criterion for awarding death sentence the so called jurisprudential shift made under section 354 clause 3 crpc has only insisted on the court to state reasons when while awarding a sentence of imprisonment and special reasons while awarding a sentence of death penalty now uh, the crpc doesn't say rarest of the rare case it is only a judge made law what exactly is a rarest of the rare case we have no criteria uh, except uh, certain in certain cases the courts apex court says that this is the this is one of the rarest of the rare cases but in similar circumstances the very same court has we have seen that very same court awarding not awarding death penalty but awarding only imprisonment for life so where is where is a cut and dried formula or clear definition for the rarest of rare cases which itself is not an expression used by the legislature now while murder can take different shapes there can be spontaneous murders there can be murders in as a 
uh, as, as an exercise of right to private defense then there also it is causing death only but then brutal rape followed by murder dacoity with murder 396 as you rightly said custodial rape custodial murder terrorist activity these are all instances where very deterrent punishment has to be given whether it is serves as a deterrence or not is not our concern but the when as long as the statute makers the law makers have chosen to keep the death penalty on the statute book in appropriate cases should not the courts award the extreme penalty of death so as a judge i have been giving more importance to the peculiar facts of the case which is on trial before me during my entire career i awarded death penalty only in two cases the first one was a bright bunny case from kori code in that case the accused husband had transferred his affections to another lady and was constantly ill treating his wife on the ill fated day he along with his paramour and others was setting his wife ablaze after pouring kerosene on her the other case there i awarded death penalty the other case was a triple murder case from todumula the accused in that case had single handedly uh, murdered a newly wed couple and the groom's mother but in both the cases the high court altered the sentence into life in life imprisonment one lesson to be learned by trial judges i i i it was my i i was feeling like that one lesson to be learned by trial judges is that if they are dead sure about the complicity of an accused in a given case brutal murder or things like that award the extreme penalty so that either in the confirmation proceedings or in the mm-hmm. the separate appeal by the accused the high court will may, may at best con, um, commute the sentence into life sentence they will dare not acquit the accused <laughs> <laughs> i know of a session judge who was later uh, elevated to the high court uh, who who in one case held that having regard to the tender age of the mm-hmm. accused i am not awarding the extreme penalty of death in another case the very same judge held that say having regard to the fact that the accused is an old man advanced in age i am not awarding the extreme penalty of death the uh, the uncle, uncle of this particular judge happened to read the 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 gist of the judgment in in the media and one day the uncle called him and asked him so you will award death penalty only to middle aged women <laughs> yet another aspect on which i would like to uh, articulate is the consequence of delayed ex- execution of death penalty we had several instances of course by um, the apex court had uh, taken that view in several cases that when there is a delayed execution of the death penalty that is a fit case for converting the death penalty into imprisonment for life Uh, uh, until the constitution bench of the supreme court in triveni ben versus state of gujarat year 1989 supreme court 1335 giving a, a crying a halt to that practice ever so many cases the appellate judges appellate courts and in 226 petitions i the constitution court used to convert the death penalty into imprisonment for life for this for the sole reason that here is a person in fact they were taking umbrage under article 21 of the constitution of india to say that here is a person the sword of democles has been hanging over his head for pretty long time in fact in one case ev vadi shuren's case 1983 to acc 68 supreme court even two judges bench even laid down a, a proposition of law that where, where the death penalty is delayed the execution is delayed by 2 years and more it is in all those cases the death penalty should be converted into imprisonment for life fortunately that was overruled by a sher singh's case uh, 83 supreme court 4653 judges they said no you can't uh, have such a cut and dried formula of uh, converting or altering the sentence whenever the, the because after all we are we are doing what we are accusing ourselves we are accusing ourselves for the delay in 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 completing the trial 
or in completing the appeal delay in the in the judicial process we are pleading guilty that we are slow we there is delay in our system but uh, what what uh, um, offense did the victim did for this the benefit always goes to the accused not to the victim here is a victim or the the near relatives of a dead deceased victim who who are who who, who have no nothing to say about that so it is court without hearing them court is awarding converting or altering the death sentence into a imprisonment for life there were so many decisions uh, we have come across un, un, until the constitution bench in 1989 held that no you can't do that of course after the of, after the the appeal final final appeal before the supreme court is disposed of if there is delay in in the execution or delay on the part of the governor of a state or on the part of the president of india in disposing of the the clemency petition then consider the question of delay otherwise the delay in the in the judicial process you can't uh, virtually you you are accusing ourselves you are pleading guilty yeah, and in some in some cases accuse himself may be um, responsible for the delay for pro- procrastination therefore these are two aspects on which i wanted to make my articulation thank you wonderful lecture good subject thank you vibrant thank subject you. So thank you, Ram Kumar, sir. sir. Ram Kumar, sir. Spare no. the rod and spoil the child. Let us hear from you. <laughs> See, nowadays the whole difficulty is the Rousseau principle of uh, uh, spare the rod and save the child has given a go by now because we have already become more mm-hmm. technologically based crime criminals now. So the cyber crime you can understand now. The innocent ch- children also using that for committing crimes. That is a that is a Uh, way of life we are now uh, dealing going going with because you cannot expect a, the unless you reach a stage of uh, what do you call the ramarajya or whatever it be as gandhi has said a, a lady with uh, ornaments during midnight if she can go go through the uh, streets without fear then only you can say that the you have achieved the crimeless stage and punishment may not come but that stage we do not know it is only a dream unless such a stage reaches retributiveness reformative etc required for the purpose of deciding the question of sentencing policy as how the case is are dealt with as roshan man roshan man said see suppose i am sending i am convicting a first offender with a uh, highest punishment and sent to jail what is the guarantee that the reformative system will be possible or a correction mechanism will be adopted in a jail to provide him a reformation when he comes out the society can accept because he will become more hardened criminal because he is uh, being put along with the other people see in one occasion when i was in the uh, the as a district judge used to meet the, uh, the, the jail authorities you must have a grading system you must have a system where you must be put the uh, criminals in a different uh, compartments so that they may not be there is there is no possibility of mixing with the mixing mixing uh, the mixing with the criminal with the other people they are the first offender with the other so that will give him a chance for him to reformation and if you can think that the, that person can be reformed you must provide him the opportunity of reformation by providing education or other purposes you will must be provided that the boston schools are not working nowadays earlier the boston schools were there children were being sent to that area the schools they were graduated and they are getting employment also by the time they came out and even shobhraj's case during the period of jail he wrote a good book that doesn't mean that a criminal will never reform valmiki valmiki the olden days he was a thug but become a, a, a reform a reform a, a reformed himself as a stage so it's not that it will not be possible that it is always for the, this is a it is a divine duty for the judge to ascertain as to whether how much sentence will have to be provided for a, even a similar offense that depends upon the weighing of the situations the circumstances under which the crime was committed what makes him to do it and whether whether it is an intentional or unintentional all those things will be even in the cases where the supreme court has said rare of rarers you will have to analyze the uh, the gravity of the offense and also the way in which it was done possibility of reformation or the possibility of retribution everything will have to be analyzed unless unless you are satisfied that 
there is a possibility of reformation in the person who is going to be awarded with death sentence you award that so this is the trust we will have to do it depends upon the nature of offense etc etc so it is a, as rosemary has said she has said that punishment is required reformation is also required how to yeah. how to uh, the, uh, the comprehensively do all those things so judge's duty is always a difficult one that is understood by her that is where we we will have to do our thing our exercise because mere punishment is not going to help but at the same time punishment is also plays a role in preventing crimes being committed because in one of the judgments the supreme court has said the punishment is required not for the purpose of knowing the person who committed must know the pinch of the crime he has committed at the same time it is a lesson for others that he should not repeat that he, he, uh, they, he they should not do it if they do it they will also put in the same position so this message will go to the people when the punishment depending upon the nature of crime how it has been done is being correlated in a judge in a by, by a judge in writing the judgment and sentencing policy sentencing policy is always a difficult thing because it uh, it is very difficult to lay any hard and fast rule in which you, in which case you can be uh, reformative theory or other thing even the latest supreme court has said in the narcot uh, the narcotic cases where the the offenders who are using narcotic for their personal consumption under section 27 there is no meaning in sending him to the jail because they are not committing any offense but they are spoiling themselves so they must be sent to the de addiction center and make them make them understand the difficulties of these things and make them reform that is the attitude of punishment that is what what is required in such case that is at the same time merely because it is a small quantity which is being used by a person for selling it merely because, because i am i have got my own reservations when the small quantity has been reduced with the punishment by virtue of that you are it is become bailable now 2002 amendment ah huh? 2002 <laughs> amendment yes the, the see, narcotic lobby has played a so <laughs> see when you are doing it for your livelihood knowing that you are and were tarnishing the society you are so affecting the society knowingly that that person who is going to be addict he is going he have a lot of problem in his life and even he become a criminal also sometimes because the, the narcotic drug make makes him do certain things for the purpose of achieving the purpose or getting that uh, the drug for his uh, personal enjoyment also so these are all the areas we will have to find out that the punishment theory is always a difficult one for a judge to decide and also there the discretion will not be exercised depending upon in most of the cases now i do not know how many cases the profaneness of offenders act has been applied by the people when i had a occasion to uh, in one of the sessions where i addressed the junior the lawyer lawyer community i said the judges must also understand the probation offenders act where wherever possible they will have to do it but only thing is you will have to get a report from the probation officer as to what is the circumstances whether the people is likely to uh, take him back when he uh, he has been let on probation that too with a cost that within two years if he is reformed since he did not go for an uh, undertake that, that there also only the sentence is postponed or execution of the sentence is postponed not that he has not been acquitted so that must be attitude where we have to take some area of where the discretion of judges in uh, uh, the awarding sentences that will sometimes it may help Uh, thank you very much for uh, a beautiful lecture on this aspect always a, a what you call a, a difficult to answer because you cannot have a even the krishna jara said it is required never said but though he was advocating for uh, abolishing death sentence but he never said that the retributive system should go the retributive should be there, there along with that you must have a reformative system and the persons in jail also must be treated uh, equally but with some restrictions of fundamental rights not that he will be entitled for all the fundamental rights he is also a right of life a decent life in a jail and he should not be treated as a criminal as a criminal or a, merely because he is a criminal he must be met the cruel treatment so that is the attitude of the supreme court also when uh, dealing with the, uh, the prison reforms also so it is, a, it is an area where unless the mindset of the people changes and also the society understand that we must have a crimeless society i don't think that uh, Uh, the, the 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 abolishing of punishment is going to have a kind of society punishment is required and only thing is what is the quantity of punishment will not be given that will not be analyzed by the by the court when evaluating each case on case base thank you very much thank you thank you uh, 
uh, Ramakrishnan sir, uh, and for that matter, um, uh, can I just pose a question to Roshan Dalvi ma'am, Ram Kumar and Ramakrishnan sir? Uh, your experience in the bench and of course in the bar, is it that the punishment, the quantum, uh, or the certainty of the punishment, which did make a change in the, uh, uh, what do you call, attitude in the society? I'm not very sure about that. I just would like a clarification from Roshan Dalvi ma'am for one thing. See, I'm not a sociologist. I'm only a lawyer and a judge. I have not really done this research as to whether any kind of a punishment given changed society. But punishment given may change the man who is punished. Right. And, and therefore, there are various, various different kinds of cases and different kinds of punishments. To apply them wherever it comes, as Justice um, Krishna has said, that as, as per the facts of each case. Correct. Ram Kumar, sir, would you like to add on to that? Same thing, same thing. We don't take a feedback on the impact of our judgment on the society. In one case, I know I um, convicted a person for murder and he was awarded imprisonment for life. And uh, after several years, I was attending a legal aid clinic and there were um, and uh, there were so many people in, engaged for food, etc. For and one person who served food on, food for me was this person. He was he had come on uh, probation. <laughs> he was he had come on probation, and he was <laughs> I was, was taken aback. So you did take the food, right? I took the food. <laughs> <laughs> he, he lovingly did that. It is not that because every human being had a tendency to commit crime. Because even you and I, I will have a Circumstances. tendency to no 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 lack, have, no, of, you, lack no. of opportunity. Uh, ah, no no lack of no lack of opportunity is not there. Discretion in your mind whether to do it or not. The consequences you have to face will play a great role for preventing you from committing the crime. That is the that is the lesson that is being given by a punishment. Right. Because right. if you see that I, you may also see a good look girl, you may have a feeling to have a sexual intercourse with her, but you will not do it because you know what is the consequences. Right. You not know, all. Not huh? all. Not all. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm not saying at least some. At least so, some it will have some impact on some literate people. Literate class, of course. Literate so, class. No, even the literate class are also doing the same thing. The school teacher is raping a uh, student now. So we'll change the example. So we can't and, uh, say the that literacy, literacy has Sam, those <laughs> wants to say something. Mm. Yeah, ma'am, please. Rose, ma'am. Yeah. Sir, I'm proud to say that even our Kerala High Court has come out with a lot of good decisions. I still remember Justice Chetul Shankaranayak's decision in Kunyamon versus State of Kerala. Where he was justifying punishment. He said, where a girl was raped, he says, the serene life which she had dreamt of has been destroyed. And then he advocated for harsh punishment. Again, Justice A.S. Anand in Radhesham was the state of Jammu and Kashmir. At that time, he was Chief Justice of Jammu and Kashmir before coming to the Supreme Court. He said, crimes against women should be handled with a harsh iron hand. Now, our Kerala High Court, even recently, the judgment came out only in December 2020, 11th December 2020, uh, where the Supreme Court, it went then to the Supreme Court, of course. The court says giving punishment to the wrongdoer is at the heart of the community of delivery. But in our country, it is the weakest part of the administration of criminal justice because of the same reason that the sentencing policy may not be the same. Because uh, when it comes to sentencing, developing countries have come out with a sentencing commission, a sentencing act. But I agree with Justice Ram Kumar. It has to be individualized punishment, you know. Serious concerns have been even expressed by Malimath Committee. Uh, the Justice Malimath Committee saying, advocating for introduction of sentencing guidelines 
but it's not really practical because cable will differ. It will vary from cable to cable. Absolutely. Um, uh, the wrongdoer should be punished, but uh, uh, as long as we do not have a, a perfect, uh, what do you call, investigating agency or the way in which uh, things happen at times, it goes. Dilip, sir, your comments, please. Good evening. Good evening. I should start with a caveat. I am not a criminal lawyer. I have not been, and I have not handled any criminal case so far. Only you can do that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, be, you better do that. <laughs> <laughs> For a civil lawyer, criminal law is nothing. All right. Okay. Only just because I heard this topic and it was very interesting and informative. Thank you, Madam. My only doubt is is it the offense or is it the wrong or the wrongdoer being punished? Is it the offense or the offender being punished? Is it the crime or the criminal being punished? I heard Madam say that it is not the crime, it's the criminal that's being punished. But when we assess these principles of sentencing, I think the deterrence policy and the retributive policy are applied only when the offense is being punished. This offense need should not be repeated, or it should not be repeated not by that person, but by the public at large, even by that person. But when it comes to rehabilitative, rehabilitative or reformative, policy of punishment. That applies only to the offender, the person who comes. So that I think that all depends on the subjective satisfaction or subjective so social outlook of the person who's passing the sentence. If somebody wants a particular victim or a class of victims to be I mean, uh, protected against any kind of violence, not that particular violence, then he may opt for a retributive form of punishment. And if he feels that, no, the, the manner in which it was done it has some justification or has some causes which uh, justifies the person offender in doing the crime, then his punishment should be coexistent existent with with uh, the way of way to reform or to have rehabilitative. So I think it is almost I mean, it's very much uh, dependent on the personal outlook or subjective satisfaction or the social outlook of the person passing the judgment. So we cannot we cannot amalgamate or we cannot prescribe a set of rules how an offender or an offense, a person committing an offense should be punished. It all depends on the person may in which the offense was punished. Then the question is whether a prescription of the minimum sentence is proper. In the stealing case, where in a theft case, where a child was stolen for a loaf of bread, and a person stealing robbery, I mean, ornaments from the journal, are they being given some sort of punishment if minimum, if there is a minimum sentence prescribed for that offense? That also will militate against the social, uh, reformative or rehabilitative rule of, uh, of sentence. So I would like to hear, Madam, just to give me a enlighten me on that. Can I? Yeah, please. Can I speak? Oh, yes. uh, two aspects. One. Well, I, I said that, I, I mean, I'd like to clarify that, that the retributive attitude in the retributive trend, the focus was on the crime. But there was a shift in the focus, not just totally ignoring the crime, but in the rehabilitative and reformative trend of punishment, there was a shift from the crime to the criminal. Not ignoring the crime, but the focus is on the criminal. That is what I meant. And secondly, uh, your second point, sir, I think you spoke about minimum sentence policy. 
I totally agree with you. Earlier, the rape cases, it was the same punishment. It's a question of rape. If it was rape, then the punishment was the same. It is mm -hmm. only after that uh, mm -hmm. Mathura case that the rape laws were amended and there was a minimum sentence policy of not less than seven years ordinary rape cases. And for aggravated forms of rape, 10 years. And the co and the, uh, legis and the IPC, the law articulated what are these aggravated forms. Custodial rape, minor below 12 being raped, a pregnant woman being raped, gang rape, then rape in these custodial situations. Custodial rape. Yeah, custodial, hospital, police. So that aggravated forms of rape articulated and a minimum 10 years imprisonment was kept. But I, I would like to draw a very important point. In fact, my MPhil was on this, on sentencing policy, and I drew out 100 cases to show lots of cases of disparity and inconsistency. Exactly what Justice Ram Kumar said, I came across. One judge said, because of the young age of the accused, I'm giving him a lesser punishment. And the very same judge, I quoted it in my thesis, two years later, says that he is not a young boy, he's 18 year old, he should have known the consequences of his life. It's just that so many cases come up before a court. And you know, the judge had taken that stand. And not only that, many cases where one judge would say, okay, for the young age, we could give a younger, lesser offense, but another, other judges would say that he is not a young boy, he should get a severe punishment. So we can't blame anybody for this. That is where the issue came, should sentencing guidelines be brought. Yes. And even that maximum sentence, minimum sentence, there was a clause, it should be the minimum, but for special and adequate reason, they can give a lesser punishment. That was taken away in the 2013 amendment because of the number of disparities. So that answers your question, sir, about minimum sentence. Definitely necessary. But with the moment of discretion, and I'm not saying discretion should not be there. Section 303 was struck down because there was no discretion. Within it. But the moment if there is discretion, the likelihood of disparities which can be helped by framing to some extent guidelines. Like Bachchan Singh speaks of rarest of rare, Machi Singh gives some guidelines. So, but we cannot give one answer to every case at hand. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh, Mr. Dilip, yes. while the lawmaker fixing a mandatory minimum sentence, see, two aspects are there. One, one it was all done because they don't trust the judges who have been who have been misusing the so called discretion in them that is why the legislature lawmaker doesn't trust the judges that is why this mandatory minimum has been fixed and uh, uh, the the leeway the leeway available to the judge is taken away by fixing the minimum mandatory sentence and uh, it it can work injustice in a given case as as uh, um, Dr. Rose Varghese mentioned, in a, in a given case, it can, a minimum mandatory sentence can work in justice. And in the case of habitual offenders, we apply a different yardstick. Habitual offenders, after all, they are habitual offenders having many convictions to their credit or discredit. So you treat them differently. Yeah, it is always said, habitual offenders means it is a habit. You cut the edge from habit, a bit remains. You, you cut the A from <laughs> habit, it remains. <laughs> so it is, it is a, encourage, they are encouraging, considered to be encouraging. Yes. Sir, uh, wonder, uh, wonderful. I'd say, I mean, uh, uh, objective or subjective justice. Uh, I mean, we'll do one thing. Uh, the introductory remarks was given by Roshan Dalvi, ma'am. So the concluding one also, ma'am, it's your prerogative. I think all have concluded now <laughs> that I, I don't think a society today can remain without punishments. Only thing is, there should be, yes, as they say, objective criteria, 
and that criteria should be both for the offender and the offense. It should be wisely used and any discretion cannot be mischievously or unwisely used. And that is why that discretion under 376 has been taken away in 2013. But what has it left us? There could be a case of a young boy and we've just got to, if suppose there is evidence that they had sexual relations, it is statutory rape, and you cannot give less than the minimum sentence now, you have to give him seven years. Yes. That is the law. Now, after that will be the reformation then. After that is the question of humane treatment of his. Because now the judges' hands are tied. And I used to take so many of these workshops in those years when I was a judge for gender justice and all, and all these women's um, um, uh, crimes against women cases. And we were all the time saying that being young and being old are not the reasons which are just and adequate. But it was not sort of heeded. Anybody just took anything. And because of that indiscretion today, that less than the minimum sentence has gone. And you see, when the, in India, we had that minimum sentence all the time from 1860, because Macaulay thought that there must be a yardsticks. It is a kind of sentencing guideline. Up, up to the, not less than, not more than this, and not less than that. It's a sentencing guideline, which he gave. But in England, it was not given to those judges. On the footing that judges know so well, they're so wise. But it was not so wisely used. And there also there was indiscretion. And therefore, there was a clamor that you must have minimum um, uh, sentencing guidelines in the statute itself so that judges know that this statute deserves this kind, this uh, offense deserves this kind of punishment. And though they said that th this would take away the independence of the judiciary, it was held, no, it does not take away independence. You've got independence within these parameters you work. That is our sentence in policy. That's how it was. So you see, everywhere you go, there has got to be an ambit. And therefore, you were, and somebody was saying, you know, that, you know, we don't know uh, uh, in the society what would have happened. You and I are both criminals, just as Krishna has said. Yes, I was traveling in uh, France by the train. And I know that everyone comes as soon as we sit down and they check the tickets. I had taken ticket from, say, A to B. But I required to go to C ultimately. You know, I mean, I just felt. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't do it because if I were to do that, I don't have that ticket. And if I extended my journey, and if somebody came to C, I would be in jail. And who's going to release me on bail? No, and in France, I can't even speak well in French. So that thought made me get down at the wrong stop because I had taken that ticket. And I had to again go back. But it was because of that punishment that we would get. It was not because I was a great girl traveling in France. It was, if I was in India, I don't know what I would have done. I couldn't just go this way. You know, People's, people have said that, so what if you throw um, garbage here? This is India. This is not Singapore. Coming from Singapore. They have not done that in Singapore, but they do that in India. And it is not because one country is superior or another country is inferior. It yeah. is because the punishment, the pain of punishment is not there. We are all guided by some punishment from the time we are kids. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. That's good. Um, uh, if uh, uh, no other take by Ram Kumar sir, Ramachand sir, or Rose madam, can we conclude? Please. Uh, Yes. So sure. it's, what remains to me is only to profusely thank all of you uh, for being, uh, in, uh, despite the uh, technical hitches, were in, uh, we had some issues and still now we were not able to accommodate all those who wanted to enter. But I'm sure that this will be available in the YouTube and everybody will uh, uh, derive the benefit of that. But um, I would say, Rose Madam, it's always a pressure. 
mm-hmm. having you on the platform and hearing you and uh, i'm indebted to you also in another sense which i like to disclose on this platform because my daughter didn't want to do law and i don't know what the magic she did uh, 15 minutes a discussion with her and now she has completed llm even <laughs> that's the way uh, the pedagogical skills or or the way she she, she inspires students that's really wonderful and i know her from uh, uh, indian law institute days and uh, i say like i mean uh, punishment we were talking about and we were indulging in a privilege thank you very much for 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 uh, addressing on on this wonderful topic uh, and that too in such a manner that uh, it was like ram kumar sir and ramkrishnan sir and even roshan dalbi ma'am said that it was a treat uh were in uh, you 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 could go deep into it and the different nuances were test upon it was indeed wonderful and uh, thank you roshan dalvi ma'am uh, for uh, agreeing to introduce the topic uh, uh for being part of this platform you are part of the family and uh, it was it was indeed um, wonderful that you were able to spare your time uh, today and ram kumar sir thank you uh, that's the only thing that i can say and uh, ramkrishnan sir in fact thank you and all of you wonderful participants for being part and parcel of this uh, legal empowerment through interaction lecture series and till we meet again tomorrow do take care and stay safe and thank you sir